Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Fresh Off the Presses, the brand new edition of The Weekly Hero coming to you from here in Hollywood, California. This is, of course, The Weekly Hero, where we talk about all things superhero related on both the big screen and the small screen. I am one of your hosts. My name is John Campia. Awesome honor and privilege to have you guys joining me here today. And of course, I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing? I'm doing great. It's it's fantastic to be in this new studio, the production value here. <laughs> wow. I mean, I can actually look at you. It's a little bit of a difference from my spare room, isn't it's it? It's amazing. Just a I little mean, step up. You know, you've become super heroic to me putting us in this new studio. <laughs> you I'll will tell you. always be my Lois Lane. And by the way, <laughs> By the way, you might see our little guest star in here. Robert's going to talk a little bit more about this little fit fella sitting here in the middle of the table. We'll get to him in just a little bit. Absolutely. But before we do, we've got a few topics that have gone on in the world of superheroes in the past little while that we need to get to. We're going to start off with this. News dropped today that Disney's developing yet another new series for their Disney streaming service. Now, we found out a number of weeks, almost a month ago now, I guess, that Loki and Scarlet Witch were getting their own limited series being developed for their streaming service. It got a lot of us excited. And they said at the time that there would be more coming. Well, more coming there was. Yesterday, we found out that they are indeed developing almost like a buddy cop kind of idea of Winter Soldier and Falcon together in their own limited series. So, Robert, I talked about this on the John Camp show a little bit earlier, but your initial reaction when you started hearing about like this whole idea. Well, I, I read that, first of all, I had to do a double take because right. what a cool idea this is. Uh, it, both Captain America's sidekicks sort of teaming up, <laughs> uh, creating their own super team. I mean, whether it's gonna be lethal weapon of superheroes, I mean, uh, their their dynamic is great. I love those two actors. They're both very charismatic guys. Yeah. If if they, they have somebody, I think somebody who worked on Empire is writing it. Yeah. I believe, uh, yes. Who's a writer and one of the executive producers on Empire is working on the script. And for it right I now. just think the the possibilities. I mean, if these guys are like a counter espionage force traveling the world <laughs> and kicking ass or something like that, uh, what a great idea. I mean, once again, it, it's the second Marvel show that Kevin Feige is going to have his name on as a producer. The first was Agent Carter. Right. So you you have his brain Notwithstanding trust. Notwithstanding Loki and Scarlet right, Witch right, as well, right? Right, uh, right pardon me. Um, but the this is what Marvel does best. You know, you've got them really, really thinking, what would be cool? <laughs> I mean, and, and I also heard that they might add uh, the vision to the Scarlet Witch show. So the Vision and Scarlet Witch, one of my favorite relationships in comic books, to see that brought forth out of Infinity War, which was great. And I, I just think something like this, it just gets me excited because we're going to see the same kind of thought that was put into the MCU on the big screen now coming into the mm. small screen. And who knows what they're going to do. And I'm sure it's all going to be somewhat tied into the, the greater MCU since they are the actual MCU characters. Right. And I can only see that the rich tapestry of all of this is going to be great for all of us. You know, one of the interesting I, things I here about this, you talked about, you mentioned the idea of getting some stuff on the small screen that could be, you know, equal to the care and the attention that they put on the big screen. Interesting caveat to all that is that whereas Ike Perlmutter is generally the guy who's in charge of all the Marvel stuff that happens on television, right. and Kevin Feige has nothing to do with that stuff, this Disney streaming stuff is a horse of a different color, to quote a little bit of Wizard of Oz there. Right. <laughs> it, this is the one where Kevin Feige is going to have a hands-on involvement in Loki, Scarlet Witch, with maybe Vision, and of course, Winter Soldier and Falcon. How does that change your perception of possible series like these as opposed to possible series on any other platform? Well, I think, again, it's the thought that's going to go into these shows. I think, look, one of the problems with television is when you create a new show, you don't know if it's going to last. Right. Network programming, they come up with shows like Manifest, they, the, which is a new show. Which that, I like, by the way. I've been I, watching I've been, it. I've been digging it. I've yeah. been digging it, but I'm like, they don't know why this plane disappeared. You know, they'll, they'll, <laughs> you they're think, like, they disappeared we'll for figure five. it out in season yeah, three. Yeah, went through a time rift. We'll just we'll, we'll give it out in drips and drabs. Like, ooh, they're gonna, the kid sees a bright light in the last episode, <laughs> you know. But, but a show like Falcon, because it's a limited uh, – uh, 
Falcon and Winter Soldier, because it's a limited sh- series, yeah. they're going to have all those scripts written before they go into production. They're going to be able to have a great arc. Like, I don't know if you've seen this new BBC show that now is on Netflix called Bodyguard. Well, it's the, it's the dude from uh, Game, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, yeah. yeah it, everybody's race. It was like the number one uh, launched show that the BBC has like ever had or something like that. I haven't seen it yet. Though. You know, it's, it's six episodes. It's an hour long episode each. It's you know, about, back in the day, it used to be called miniseries. Yes, yeah, so mini now they're called limited, limited series. series, like comic books. Yeah, and it it was very well scripted. There were some incredibly tense moments in the show, some great action, great characterization, and that's what we're going to get. We're going to get an eight hour long movie, essentially, with a, with an established beginning, middle, and middle end, and already end. planned out. And that's what excites me is that we're going to get stories that are that are thought out, that are really carefully considered. And if we get things like what I can imagine, the show would be like what body guard was like i mean there was really there was a lot of governmental intrigue there was a lot of backstabbing and this one guy didn't know our main character doesn't know what quite is happening it gets pulled into this and gets double crossed and if they do a show like that we're all in for a treat and that's what i'm looking forward to i don't know i don't know about the governmental stuff i picture more well no it doesn't i'm just saying as as an example i i'm picturing more of falcon and and bucky sitting down in the bar one day and bucky kind of goes you know i haven't been laid in 85 years (laughs) and falcon going you know anthony mackie is christmas are you kidding we're going to vegas and then the whole eight episodes takes place in vegas and it's just one whole big mission of Falcon trying to get Bucky laid for the first time in 85 years. But let me ask you this, because here's the thing, too. Really? You don't think Bucky got busy in Wakanda after whatever happened there happened? Uh, The Great White Wolf? I don't know. Maybe he (laughs) he was kind of an oddity to a lot of people. That might be intriguing to some. Okay, so here's my thought on this. When we start talking about the Loki series... A lot, I mean, is the potential there that that means they're bringing Loki back? Sure, but I think most of us are kind of operating on the assumption that it's going to be some sort of prequel story uh, before the events of Infinity War. That's what we're assuming at any rate. I've heard some people suggest, well, I mean, because obviously Bucky and Falcon both dusted in Avengers 3, right? Right. And some people are suggesting, oh, this will be a prequel story too. But uh, my point on this is that it can't be a prequel story. Look, they met in... Um, uh, where the Winter Soldier, no, not Winter Soldier, they met in, uh, or was it Winter Soldier? Yeah. But anyway, by the end of Avengers, uh, Civil War, Captain America Civil War, he goes into the deep freeze. Right. And then when we next see him, he's in Wakanda's White Wolf. There is simply, the argument I was making is that there's simply no period of time that these two characters could have developed a relationship, gone off, and had an eight-episode adventure. So to me, that makes it pretty clear that this series is going to be post-Avengers 4. Agree, disagree? Do you see the holes Uh, in my logic? I think think all of these shows are going to be post-Avengers 4 because clearly... You know, I read this great theory, my favorite online theory about what's going to happen in Avengers 4, and a lot of it has to do with our f- post-snap remaining Avengers right. traveling back through time and influencing events that we've already seen in order to manipulate the time stream to prevent or to indeed, maybe not prevent, but somehow alleviate what happened. Right, and that's a common theory going around, right? right. That, that is I, the prevailing I, the, theory right Yes, now. and I, there was a guy who came up with a bunch of different things, and I thought it was great. I recently, it, it was something new, a new theory that I, I won't, I can't remember the whole thing. But if that's the case, and they're able to restore not the timeline, because the snap happened. Yeah. Everybody died. It would They would have to change the timeline to prevent that occurrence from happening. And Kevin Feige has said one of his great uh, influences was the last episode of Next Generation, All Good Things, right. which is a time One of the, traveling. Probably the greatest series finale of all time. No doubt. And then there's also another Star Trek episode called City on the Edge of Forever, right. where it's a very famous episode of the original series where they have to let somebody die in order to restore the timeline to be the way it was supposed to be. Now, if, it, if something like Avengers 4 ends that way, it's going to be amazing and it's going to be heart wrenching. And it's going to probably be the most epic superhero movie ever made. But if it restores the timeline, we're going to see new versions of these characters. I mean, they're the same, but they will not have gone through probably. They won't even remember the snap because they were dusted. Depending on how they approach it. But will it it be that heartbreaking? We saw, I mean, I'm sorry. It depends who dies. After we have Tom Holland going, I don't feel so good, Mr. Stark. I don't want to go. Oh, by the way, Spider-Man Far From Home coming up. How heartbroken can we be with any uh, of these deaths? uh, But but we knew, everybody knew that Avengers 4 was coming out next year. 
And they yes. knew Spider-Man Far From Home was going to get made, if that's a prequel or yeah. not. And we know there's going to be another Black Panther. And we uh, Right. And we know, but in this know. case, someone's going to sacrifice. Someone's well, going to make, I think. We'll see. But then I think that makes that, that we're going to see a post-Avengers 4 series, which also opens up new possibilities because maybe, maybe the relationships these characters have are altered because of what happens in Avengers 4. And they're not the same, quite the same, the way we've seen them already. You know what it sounds like you're describing? It sounds like you're describing uh, Age of Apocalypse. That's what it sounds like you're describing. A, uh, you know, a little bit. It's got a little it, bit of that too. It. it could, if, if it's not so dark, uh, we might see that the characters might be in different places. By the way, I love that story. Oh, it's, it's my all-time favorite comic book story. Oh, Age of Apocalypse is my all-time it's favorite the story. Greatest. All right, let's move on to another issue here that's been coming up. You know, we've got December 21st coming out, and that entire week, stretching back eight days, is a killer's row of big, high-profile movies opening from Peter Jackson's Mortal Engines, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Mary Poppins, Bumblebee. You've got a Will Ferrell comedy. You've got a Steve Carell drama. You've got another Deadpool movie of some sorts. But right in all of that is Aquaman, directed by James Wan. This is the question that's been coming up. Since Justice League, it's fair to say that the DC universe on screen is a little shaky. I, I, I think even people who are the most diehard yeah. of DCU fans will acknowledge it's probably a little bit shaky right now. Justice League was a disappointment to both financially and not as many people loved it as, as we had hoped. So that's fine. The question is coming out now. When you've got a guy, a director like James Wan, which I think most of us admire quite a bit. The Absolutely. dude's got a great eye for these films. I like Jason Momoa's Aquaman very much. I think the trailer that came, both that came out of Comic-Con and that five-minute piece they put out were fantastic. So here's the question that's coming up right now. Considering the condition the DCEU is in right now, if Aquaman comes out and is as good, let's not even worry about the finances for a second. Forget the box office. If it's as good not as good as Logan, not as good right. as The Dark Knight, but if it's as good as we think it could be, here's the question. Could this one movie change the general perception we have of the DCU as a whole? Can Aquaman on its own basically take a lot of pessimism that a lot of us feel towards the DCU, and could that be converted into looking a little bit more on the bright side. Could it create an optimism about the DCU that does not currently exist right now? So Robert, I ask you, how much influence can Aquaman on its own create in changing the perception of the DCU right now? Well, I think quite a bit. I mean, it's coming on the heels of the standalone Wonder Woman movie as well. Right. And with the one-two punch of Wonder Woman and Aquaman, you're kind of restoring the Justice League, one Unf film at a time. Unfortunately, there was something in between <clears throat> there know. that did not succeed no, so well. No, it's, it's absolutely true. But I, I do think if if Aquaman is a smashing success, and by, it, looks, it looks like it's a lot of fun. I do have some trepidation about it, though. Really? I do. And my trepidation is the tone of the movie is so fantastical, it looks like, that one of the reasons I think the MCU is so successful is they've done a really good job of having – Asgard and the quantum realm and Doctor Strange all existing together, but it's still grounded in a reality that we believe in. Right. We watch it and we're like, these characters could exist in, I've always believed that, we want to believe that we can look out a window and see a superhero swing by. It's, it's, the, it's the notion that I call the fantastic within the mundane. Absolutely. It feels like it's in our world. And my favorite word, verisimilitude. The MCU has verisimilitude. It has a reality across all of these wacky concepts, whether you're talking about the, as the gods of Asgard, the quantum realm, or you're talking about the nowhere, the, the, master, <laughs> nowhere, the master of the mysticism, that, the mystic arts that Doctor Strange is. You believe in it. But is Aquaman... Does it go too far? I mean, I love it as a fantasy film, but when you know that Atlantis, which is all full of you know sharks with armor, fighting <laughs> seahorses with armor, I mean, and and dudes like Orm and Black Manta, and I mean, it looks pretty balls to the wall, Lord of the Rings epic fantasy, which I'm into. Right. I'm like, great, that could be awesome, but can you build the DC universe off of that? It's going to be really interesting to see. Like you said, where's the mundane in Aquaman? Does it exist? Right. I don't know. I think that's a really interesting point you make. The mundane and the fantastical within, the coming fantastic together. Within the mundane, yeah. <clears throat> and that's what that's what makes those movies so so great. However, if the movie's great and we want to see Aquaman again, 
we're going to want to see those characters team up. You know, we, it's a natural thing. We want to see them exist in the same movie. But Aquaman looks like you're getting a whole pantheon to look at. I mean, maybe we don't need another DCEU movie. We just need to see another Aquaman film and another Wonder Woman movie. Because where's the Flash now? The Flash is no longer, you know, it's more about Batman. Who knows? You know, here's funny. On the John Campy show the other day, one of the viewers wrote an email and said, you know, and they reminded me of when I had Stephen Amell, who plays Oliver Queen Arrow on TV. He was in this studio, actually, and he was talking with me. And just two weeks earlier, The Flash had premiered on television. And two, it was on the second week that they announced Ezra Miller was going to be The Flash in the movies. The reason that's so funky is because now when the Flash movie is supposed to come out, the Flash TV series is going to be in its seventh season. Now, so just put that in perspective. But I'm going to tell you what, Robert, Aquaman will change the perception of the DCU, and I'll tell you two reasons why. Reason number one is this. So many people have already forgotten. I'm glad you brought it up. You brought up Wonder Woman. So many people have already forgotten. We are a what have you done for me lately kind of people. Right. We really are, right? And we forget what was going on just three minutes ago, let alone three months ago. But when Wonder Woman came out and just triumphed at the box office, the, it was the first DCU movie, a DCU, not, not counting Christopher Nolan's Batman right. films, the DCU, it was the first DCU movie that the critics embraced in love, that the audience embraced in love. It had financial success. It hit the trifecta, right? There was a period of a number of months there that the perception of the DCU had really started to swing. People were talking now about the DCU in terms of optimism instead yes. of skepticism, right? And then Justice League came, and then that kind of ended that momentum. But that's number one. So if Aquaman can recapture that, I think it'll be on the right track. But the second reason goes directly where you're talking about, the, the mundane, the fantastic within the mundane. Here's why I think that Aquaman trailer and the tone of that trailer works. Because to me... We've now got Walter Hamada as the right. sheriff of, of WB, right? He seems to be changing the tone of their whole universe. Does, to your point, does the tone of this Aquaman trailer fit in with the tone of Batman versus Superman? No, it doesn't. But you know what it does fit in the tone with? Shazam. Well, yes. So, we, so now we start to see that Hamada, the DCU, is being reshaped to have a different tone, a different feel. You pointed out more fun, more entertainment, and yet getting into the fantastical. And if they can do that, and if they can use Aquaman to start that transition, and they crush, I mean, hey, this is all predicated on that big if. Yes. If it's good, and who knows, this movie might be a sack of crap. But if it's that good, those are the two reasons that I believe this thing can change perception just like Wonder Woman did. I, I think, you know, I, I would agree with everything that you said. And another thing that what I love is that the DC universe, the comic universe that I grew up with, I was always more of a DC kid growing up than Marvel. Mm. The Aquaman movie looks like what it felt like to read DC comics growing mm. up because of the epic nature of Atlantis, because of the the fantastical nature of, of what you're watching. I mean, there's that scene where they're driving in a car and a wave is taking some yeah. like, like Navy destroyer and throwing <laughs> it behind them. I'm like, well, that's pretty awesome. You know, and then there's a, a nuclear submarine that he lifts out of the water and the battling armors and whatever. It, it looks to me awesome. Like I look at it and go, this is, this is what I would have wanted to watch when I was a kid and as an adult who's still a kid at heart, bring it on. And I hope so. I think you're right, though. I think, you know, I didn't think of it that way. They're, 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 they're making a total tonal change yeah. overall. And, you know, in a, in a way, that might work out because I think Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, at least the ultimate version, has that fantastical quality. Once they yeah. bring in Doomsday, and it might, that actually might fit retroactively better in with Wonder Woman, Shazam, and Aquaman. I hadn't thought of you. Yeah, you're right. You might retroactively actually improve how we view the previous film. Right. That's interesting. Because the tone's going to, oh, okay, we can have Doomsday and we can, it, we can be a little bit more, because it's kind of, that movie's kind of wacky. <laughs> it it's kind of wacky. They had to throw everything but this kitchen sink in it. But now, I mean, after Wonder Woman being so straightforward in a World War One story, 
but her character is now so beloved, and, and Gal Gadot is so great as Wonder Woman. Oh she's God, sort of... let's not get into that argument right now. <laughs> well, no, I didn't mean to, but I, like she's beloved. I think now she's beloved and... by some, yes, but... by some misguided souls, but, yes. But I, I, I think with Shazam and with Aquaman, it's going to be really interesting because, like you said, the tone of the entire DC universe will then be completely 180 degree. It is yeah. no longer this dark, brooding universe it's now going to be bright even even the undersea kingdom of atlantis now is beautiful and colorful and full of phosphorescence yeah <laughs> it look you know it reminded me a lot a little bit of avatar i remember when, when, when yeah. we saw that in the trailer I, I got a little bit of a sense of avatar all right well listen we could talk about this all day but we may need to move on but before we get on to our next topic there's a little tradition we have here <laughs> on the weekly hero because you know robert is one of the great figure collectors in the world. He is one of the great figure collectors. He always has something really cool to bring in. And you, no exception today, have brought in something pretty damn cool for us to look us. Tell us about this little guy in the red jacket and the red motorcycle. Well, uh, 2018 marks the 30th anniversary of the seminal Japanese animated film, Akira, right. that most people saw on the big screen. And uh, almost a decade ago, Bandai, which is one of the great Japanese toy companies, teamed up with Metacom, which is an action figure company, and they created this. And this is a six-scale version of Kaneda and his, of course, the coolest motorcycle probably ever in anything. Yeah, in any fiction. Uh, Kaneda's bike. And it was the you had to buy them separately, but they are one of my favorite six-scale toys ever because McFarland Toys had made versions of this. Other companies had made smaller versions of this, but this was the the first and only six scale version. Uh, and it all comes apart. Uh, everything's held on by metallic bolts. You can plug a stereo speaker in there, and <laughs> and it, it makes sounds and noises. And you hit the accelerator button, and the the sound from the actual bike from the movie comes on. And it's it's easily one of my favorite six scale pieces that they made. And the dashboard even lights the up. The dashboard when you have them lights on. up. I mean, the incredible. whole thing is insane. And it's funny because I never take it out of the case it's in. It's in this glass case. <laughs> I'm like, I never touch it. So I'm like, ooh, I'm going to bring it since it's the first time we're in the new studio. I'm going to take this out and bring it. And it is the 30th anniversary of the movie. We can celebrate. Yeah. A lot of people found their way into anime through Akira. Um, and it's, of course, based on, on an incredible. Uh, manga series that yeah. was repackaged this year in a big hardcover box. It's like 175 bucks to get the whole manga series. So I figured I'd bring Canada and his, and his bike to commemorate this, the first new Weekly Heroes in the new uh, studio, because it's awesome. And it's, and, and it's beautiful. You know, it's funny. I, I still think if it wasn't for Ghost in the Shell, we would probably be well into production on it because you know I've been trying to get in the for years. movie for years, and they were really close. And I honestly think Ghost in the Shell probably killed it. I think that's what put the brakes on. But the figure is absolutely beautiful. If somebody were to try to buy this figure today with the bike today, if they were trying to, try, oh. how much do you think you'd have to be paying for that on the secondary market? $1,000? It's so gorgeous. I just don't know. I mean, I haven't looked. That bike, it was sold out immediately. I mean, and what was really weird, what was funny is they actually offered, that's the anime, the movie version of it. Right. But the manga version has a bunch of other stickers. So it came with a second set of I have a second set of the bike, like the armor, right? Which all of these stickers are on it. You get to put them on the way you want. There's like a hundred different stickers, and I did that so I can actually swap out the armor. But it's this is the actual movie version, so that's why. Well, I thank it. you for bringing that in, and of course, Robert will once again be bringing in another figure next week, and I cannot wait to see you. You're surprising us every week. I can't <laughs> wait to see the next one. All right, let's now move on to our third topic today. All right. This is a little bit of old news now, but we haven't had a chance to talk about it. Some changes going on at the good ship Netflix with the MCU shows they had. You know, there was a period of time when the Netflix MCU was like considered a lot of people maybe even preferred it over the big screen MCU. We had Daredevil season one. We had Daredevil season two. We had a pretty impressive first half of Luke Cage season one. Everybody loved Punisher, all that kind of stuff. It's become a little bit hit and miss. Defenders was hit and miss with some people. Some people totally love Jessica Jones. Some of us don't. Iron Fist was a big swing and a miss. There's some different perceptions of Luke Cage season two. But now they've done a little bit of house cleaning, it looks like. First of all, they announced that they axed Iron Fist. And now Iron Fist is gone. 
Then the head of content over at Netflix came out and said, hey, yeah, yeah, but everything else is staying. We, we love the performance of all these shows, and there are shows to cancel. The very next day, they canceled Luke Cage. So first, I've got to ask you, because you and I haven't had a chance to talk about no. this. Number one, your reaction to the cancellation of Iron Fist and Luke Cage. Secondly, where do you think this all what – is, what does this all mean for the future of MCU films and MCU properties on Netflix? What do you think? Well, I think it's all – look, the days, I think, are numbered. Daredevil season three was incredible. I mean, I still haven't had a chance to watch it. Arguably one of the best, if not the best season. Incredible. Um, I think Punisher season two is going to be great as well. Season one was so good. Yeah, I just think that that these shows, and you know, I read a really interesting article about how how Luke Cage season three was deep into production. The writers' room was working. They had written many pre production, scripts. pre right pre production, and then there were creative differences somehow yeah i heard about they that, wanted yeah. to do some kind of changing of the guard or, or moving things around and when they couldn't come to grips or come to terms they just canceled the show which leads me to believe that look marvel disney they're going to move all the stuff in-house eventually it's all going to come in-house because why would you why would you give it to someone else if you don't have to you know i know netflix they'll probably they probably have some kind of reversionary clause that these shows are going to revert to disney They'll put them on their own streaming service. Maybe we'll see a Heroes for Hire show, and they'll bring back Luke Cage and Iron Fist together. I don't know, but I don't think we're going to get much more once that Disney streaming service. We've got maybe two years of those shows left. Yeah. Maybe. And it makes sense. I mean, the fact that they just announced they're shooting The Mandalorian – you know, they're making yeah. a Star Wars, which, by the way, what a great idea. And you, you know, see the lineup of directors that they oh have my God, for it. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's incredible. But that, to me, shows there was that was a lot of foresight. Okay, let's do a show in the Outer Rims that isn't, isn't beholden to the Republic or the Empire, whatever's going on. We can tell uh, uh, some – we've never seen that part of the Star Wars universe before. We could tie it into the maybe the First Order. Who knows? You know, but but that's the kind of thinking that is going on there. They're, they're, I think it shows going to be first rate. I think Disney's on their game between, between Marvel and between Lucasfilm. We're going to get something really special with that streaming – series or the streaming the streaming network and all the shows they're putting right. on and i think that we're going to get it all in house they're going to take it all in house see here's the thing to me though <laughs> the, the interesting part to me was there were some people who had the theory that oh disney made them cancel those shows which uh, i don't know the contract specifically but i'm pretty sure the contracts that netflix has precludes that for, like D disney couldn't just come to netflix and say you can't do that show anymore i'm pretty sure i think you're right and so, which raises another question to me. It's like, even if they could, even if they could, if Marvel had that power that they could just say, oh, you can't do that show anymore. Why would you want the two worst shows? Like, I, I, I know there's some of you guys that really like Luke Cage, and that's great. Iron Fist was horrible. Right. Now, season two was a step up it was Marked it was a yeah it was absolutely a recognizable improvement to the point that i would even say not bad it's still a lot of crap in there i don't know if you had a chance to watch iron fist season two or not but the relationship between the brother and sister was my favorite part of the entire right. season luke cage season one the first half of season one with cottonmouth who i believe was played by mahershala ali yeah that was must watch television great stuff then the second half of the season happened, and I almost couldn't finish it. But then I approached season two with such excitement, and I thought season two was every bit as bad as the second half of season one. I was totally let down. I hated what they did with Luke as a character. I, I just, by the end of it too, they try to pull that BS Godfather ending with the door opening and the whole, like they might as well have had them kissing the ring. It's like, yeah. oh my God, this has gone beyond homage to just, pathetic desperation well you know i also think that there's i i think there's a cost issue involved i think netflix mm. netflix has been burning through cash they're spending ungodly sums of money they're putting out i don't understand their model really i mean i, I get their subscription model but shows are dropping on netflix like every day yeah. you turn it on they're they're getting and they were going to make another offering to raise another two billion dollars i think they did yeah yeah they made another offering i think they're trying to if the show isn't a performer 
across the board, like a big performer. They renewed Ozark for season three. I right. think a show like Which Ozark, a lot of people love. I love that show, and I, I love the actors, but I'm sure it's not as costly to produce as a Marvel show. I think they're looking at the cost benefit. They're doing that yeah, cost true, benefit Yeah, true, but analysis. I mean, if you look at like a season one of Daredevil, you basically made that show for bus fare. I mean, there's really not a big budget when it comes, when you right. really look at how they shot those but shows. But I think they're looking at viewership in relation to cost, and, and it becomes academic. Mm. If those shows are not getting in the viewership, and they don't release, they don't release their... Uh, the ratings, so we don't know right. how many how many people are viewing those shows. But I think they're just like, look, if we don't have a certain number of people watching our shows for the amount of money they cost, they're gone. Right. Yeah. And I think which that, is smart. Right. It's smart. It's good business. That's how TV works. And and you know they've spent things altered carbon, incredibly expensive. Right. Show. Yeah. That was and, one of the more expensive ones. And the more they've they've offered people like Shonda Rhimes, who's a great network. Yep. They're giving her huge, huge deal. money. You know, and, and these creators who haven't made shows yet, they're giving them hundred million dollar, two hundred, three hundred fifty million dollar deals to come to Netflix. And they haven't made any. God bless them for doing it. I, I, mean, I agree. God you, bless you, for for encouraging creators. I think. But you know what else to do? On the flip side of that, what I've noticed Netflix has been doing that's been really smart. They're also doing in the midst of all that. They're also doing a lot of lower budget, almost docu series kind of stuff. Like, have you ever seen Chef's Table? That they have yeah, like, yeah. fantastic stuff, and then they're they're doing some lower budget stuff like that, as well as doing the higher budget stuff. Hey, look, whatever they're doing, whether it's smart, maybe not so smart. We gotta at least say, man, tip of the hat to them because they are really going for it, and they're putting their money where their mouth is, and they're investing in creators. And let's see if it pans out for them or not. And if and if what you gotta do in order to do that is sacrifice a couple of crappy shows, even if they have Marvel characters in them, oh, so and, be it. And uh, they're ac acquiring foreign shows like yes, Bodyguards left, One. Right and but I just watched a movie that somebody. It's another Indonesian movie, like my favorite movie, The Rad or The Raid. The Raid, the Raid too, as I call it, The Rad. But uh, there is a movie, and I want to say the, the the Night Must Come, or I forget what it's called. Mm. It is insanity. It is an action film. There's a, a fight between three girls with a bunch of knives, and what they do I'm to sold. each other. I'm sold. It is it is like watching a slasher movie meets the raid. It's insane. The violence. I could not believe how just drenched in blood this Netflix movie was. Again, an Indonesian film. What a hoot! I turned it on. I'm watching this, going, "Oh my god, this is amazing." Thank God that Netflix acquired this movie. I don't know if they paid to have it made or what, but it's awesome. By the way, your next T-shirt you have to make is that big silhouette picture of your face with hashtag what a hoot oh. beside it. I think you just <laughs> million seller shirt. What right a there. hoot. Yes, that, I love that. What a hoot. Um, All right. Yeah, great stuff. Let's move on to our final topic of the day. And our final topic today is this. Now, Venom, of course, has now silenced pretty much all the critics. A lot of people said this movie's going to flop. It can't do anything. So you can't make a Venom movie without Spider-Man, blah, blah, blah. $80 million opening weekend destroyed the uh, the October all-time October opening weekend box office, even held off Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis, has now crossed over $500 million, which some losers like me were saying, look, all this movie's got to do is make $400 million. At a $100 million budget, they're going to be popping bottles. Or they're over that. They're probably going to end up somewhere around $550 million at this point with Sony. So at this point, by every measurement, Venom was a success for these guys. However, that does not necessarily mean all is sunshine and rainbows over in the Sony Spider-Man less verse. I guess you might as well call it the Venom verse now. They got two more movies coming. One's going into production here pretty quick, and that's Morbius with Jared Leto, Academy Award winner Jared Leto. Which I can't wait to see. Yeah, I'm dying to see I mean, what kind of approach they're going to take with that. Yeah. But then also they're, they're moving steam, full steam ahead with this Craven the Hunter movie. Question is... Can they recapture that lightning in a bottle, that success? Can they replicate that success that they just had with Venom with characters like Morbius and Craven the Hunter? Can they have that success again? Yes or no? No. And I'll tell you, uh, look, Venom is a beloved character. You've got a whole generation of people that grew up with Venom, loved Venom. Venom, Venom is, is, a, is a character that people, he's beloved. Uh, Morbius is more of an obscure character. I love Morbius, but Morbius is not the kind of character that kids are going to be like, oh, I got to see Morbius the living vampire. You know, I got to <laughs> see that. And Craven. Just tell the kiddies it's it's Twilight. Just tell them it's uh, yeah, like Twilight. Yeah. They'll and, come and, out in droves. And Craven is a great villain, but Craven, again, more adult in nature. Craven mm. does not have. Venom is, is the pulpy fun 
character. You know, he's I, I, not my favorite. Like, I'd much rather see a Morbius or a Craven movie, but that's right. my, my more adult sensibilities when it comes to these things. But that's not what Spider Man is. You know, Spider Man is a character in the Spider Universe or the Spider Verse, into the Spider Verse, as we say now. The Spider Verse is something that kids love from the time they're little. It's true. They're, they're, they've got, you can get Spider Man underoos or Venom underoos. You know, you can, Venom is a character that appeals to little kids as well as adult kids, but Craven really isn't. And I don't think Morbius is a character that appeals to mm. kids either. Um, appeals to fans, certainly. And I think those movies, if they're really well done, people will go see them. I mean, I, I, Jared Leto, an Academy Award winning actor playing a vampire, I'll go see that. And if it's awesome, like who wouldn't? But it sounds like Interview with the Vampire 2. Jared Leto as a vampire, yeah, Interview with the Vampire 2. He should be playing Lestat anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't think there, it's going to be as successful. But then again, coming off of Venom, but I still think the I, I would have never thought Venom was as successful as it would have been, especially because I thought the movie was all over the place. Right. You know, it was wacky. It, it was wacky, but it was enjoyable. Let me tell you why you're right, and let me tell you why you're wrong. Oh. Number one thing, here's why you're right. And one of the things is when you're talking about Morbius and you're talking about Craven and then you throw in Venom, clearly the most recognizable out of all those characters is Venom. Clearly the type of character that lends itself to kind of big screen success just by the nature of who the character is, is Venom. You've got Tom Hardy in there. It's capitalizing on a lot of stuff right now. I mean, it just... It seems to me like all the chips fall towards Venom. If you had to bet which one of these three is going to be a success, you got to guess Venom. However, I will say this too. I think we in these circles, and I know I do this all the time, but I think all of us do, is that we in these circles, we forget that while I have grown up knowing who Venom is, and you have grown up knowing who Venom is, right. and many of you guys watching this show know who Venom is, a lot of the average movie-going audience really no. don't know all that much about who Venom is, right? They don't, so, so there's a little bit of that. But even then, the recognizability, the marketability, and the whole way you could build a narrative around that character, as opposed to, a, directly to your point, a Morbius or a Craven, it just doesn't seem to work. I think this. I think Sony can capture the success in terms of making a pleasing movie that people enjoy. You can absolutely do that with Morbius. There's some really rich stuff you can do there. Same with Craven. I think you have Craven hunting Venom. I think that's what I think that's that's how you bring Craven is he comes to town looking to hunt the greatest beast on earth, Venom, and he's hunting this dude, right? But I think at this point, all Sony can hope to do is lay the groundwork that we are making quality movies and understand and be willing to bite the bullet for now to say, hey, we know Mor Morbius ain't gonna make 390 million. We know Craven the Hunter isn't gonna make 400 million and that's okay. We are building something here. We're gonna put out a good Morbius movie that people enjoy. We're gonna put out a good uh, Craven movie that people yeah. enjoy and they're investing for the future. But I agree with you, they can do that now and plant for the future, but as far as replicating the success of Venom right now, I don't think they got a hope. I'll tell you one thing though, you know, if they do Craven's Last Hunt, which is one of my favorite Spider-Man awesome. stories ever, and if they put Venom in place of Spider-Man, that would be a huge movie. That would be fun. I mean, it would be it would be a huge movie. Or like with Morbius the Living Vampire, they get Tom Holland to come in and be Spider-Man a little bit. Because if now that they've proven, look, I'm sure that the people at the MCU probably weren't, they would have done something different with Venom. I'm sure. But now that it's been a financial success, they can't deny that it was a financial and success. And people generally enjoyed it. Like the audience, despite the fact that a lot of critics didn't like it, and I can understand why. Right. The, a lot of the fans did. It was very crowd pleasing. They they really like that, and and I still pe I, I keep seeing on on my feeds, various social media feeds. I really like Venom. You know, people that they're, they're still the surprise, but they liked it. I think more well, people was, liked I it. I was shocked. Yeah, they did. I was shocked. I liked it that much. And I think with these films, with with Morbius and with Craven, uh, they can now because Spider Man's going to come back to Sony, and they can. Tom Holland's well, Venom made five hundred million dollars. I wouldn't mind a piece of that. <laughs> you know? Look, if they put if you put a Spider Man now in with Venom, that movie makes a billion that's a billion dollar movie. But uh, you know me though, I think the success of Venom means Spider Man stays where he is. Cause now I'm thinking Sony Sony's mind, I think right now, is oh look, we can have our cake, 
making money off Marvel by having Spider-Man over there and eat it too by making our own universe and we didn't need spider-man well and if into the spider-verse is as huge as oh, i think it's going to be that's another topic then altogether. they do miles morales they don't even have to have they can have the, the miles morales version of i don't think they spider -Man. can though i don't think they can have a live action spider-man even if it's technically a different character i think but I mean, maybe look, uh, yeah. but you bring it look, we got to talk about this next time is that i think i have been underestimating the potential of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. I think I'm the biggest guilty person out of anybody. I have been underestimating this film, and we got to talk about that probably next week. But listen, guys. It looks a lot of fun. Before we do anything else, we need to save a little bit of time here. I asked you guys on Twitter, and by the way, you guys should be following me on Twitter, simply at John Campia, or follow this guy over here at Burnett RM on Twitter. I asked you guys a little bit earlier on Twitter, hey, send in some Twitter questions. Just put the hashtag, the weekly hero, in your question, and I'll see them. We've picked out four questions to take. So let's get to our first question right now. The first question that got sent in on Twitter comes to us from D.A. McLean, who writes, Hey, Weekly Hero, do you think if the Joker movie is a hit at the box office that it could spawn a new DC movie universe? All right, thanks a lot for this, D.A. I'll answer this first because my opinion on this is everybody knows, so then I want to hear yours. I, I think no. They are making this Joker movie to establish not a new cinematic universe, but to establish that we can do standalone Elseworld kind of movies. They are looking to establish outside of their cinematic universe, not a new cinematic universe, but the fact that you can tell great one-shot stories without having to be worried about connecting. So if it's a big success, that just goes to what they were trying to do. So no, I don't think you're gonna see them create a new universe around this Joker. What do you think? I agree with you 100%. I think that, that if they can do single, standalone movies that make the same amount of money if they make 750 million dollars or a billion dollars even on a joker film they've done they've that, that's a, that's a huge win then they can do a second joker movie that's only in its own universe mm -hmm. then they can the the dc universe is filled there's so many characters yeah. that and they don't have to worry about incorporating every other character i think it's a smart play uh this idea that that everybody has to have this expanded universe that we have to have the mcu i think is a fallacy it, it also limits the amount of films that we're going to get imagine if we get films about like I don't know, Hawk and Dove, which we've seen in Titans now. Right. What if somebody wants to make a cool Hawk and Dove movie? You know, now they can. Now they have a precedent. Like, oh, okay. Not we worrying can go back. that your, your hands are going to be tied by the cinematic universe. No, you can tell any story you any want. Any story you want. I'd love to see them go back and tell a, a good Catwoman story. You know, or go back and get any, do a Lex Luthor movie but have nothing to do with superman i think that's it's really exciting if it if it works you know i've been saying for a long time some of the greatest stories in the history of comic books were like one shot elseworld kind of stories whether you're talking about red sun where they are obviously the granddaddy of them all the dark knight returns right like, there's a lot of these stories there's these rich stories you can tell when you don't have to worry about being tied to a cinematic universe absolutely and they're making a smart play because it gives you the opportunity to do both yep you know they can even brand the dc universe this is a dc universe movie and or, or a dc whatever they want to call it and then we've got our standalone films as well and like you just said part of the appeal of reading comic books was they had elseworld stories i mean dc coined the phrase elseworlds that was their thing right and and being able to see those kinds of movies i'd love to see a live action gotham by gaslight or a red mm. sun or or even a, a live action killing joke done really really well i mean you could do the killing joke as a sequel to the joker movie and it could be and you could have batman come in as a one-shot actor could play batman that's not part of the Except Bruce Wayne is going to be like eight in the right. Joker movie. So that's probably not going to happen. All right, let's go to the next question. What's the next question we got here on Twitter? This one comes to us from Mike Donato, who writes, at what point do you stop caring about this Batman Matt Reeves movie? At this point, it just seems like a joke. Hashtag the weekly hero. Well, look, I I'm going to tell you what. I, like everybody else, I am I'm frustrated because I shared on, on the John Campy show that Warner Brothers initially expected there was supposed to be a delivery date of a first draft of a script, of a Batman script, a year ago, right. last September. Obviously, he just recently turned in the first draft. And it's just the first draft. I mean, it, who knows how much longer we have to go. It is frustrating. And it looks like uh, uh, Chris McKay, who was supposed to be directing a uh, the Nightwing movie. It was it Chris right. or was it Adam? I'm, I think it was Chris. Uh, who directed the, the Batman uh, Lego movie? I think it was Chris. It was one of the McKays. Right. But was supposed to direct Nightwing, but because of all the delays with the Batman thing, he waited around and waited around and waited around and waited around and waited around. Finally, he said, fine, I got to go do other things right now. 
So I get it. We're frustrated. But the bottom line is it's Batman and it's Matt Reeves. Right. I mean, if Matt Reeves hasn't earned our trust at this point as a storyteller, of course he has. That does not take away our right to be frustrated at this point. I am frustrated as a fan. Many of you guys are frustrated as fans. But I would caution and just say, in our frustration, let's not go overboard. It's still Batman, and it's still Matt Reeves. And so I am yeah. not going to give up on this. I have a lot of hope in it. Uh, frustrated, yes, but hope. It's not an either or. It's a both and. I am frustrated, but I am still hopeful. How are you feeling about this? See, I, you know, here's the thing. We'll get the movie when we get the movie. Mm, yeah. Am I frustrated that Game of Thrones season eight is taking so long <laughs> to get here? Great yes. point. Great yes, point. I am. But as long as we're going to get it and it's well done and they've taken the time to make it good, I don't allow myself to get frustrated about movies that haven't been made yet. You know, Martin Scorsese, one of his passion projects was Gangs in New York. Yeah. Took him 20 years to make it. <laughs> you know, I mean, Bill the Butcher, I love that character. Oh. You know, that however long it took him when to it make it. One of Lewis's best. Oh, so good. So to me, it's, it's like, look, I don't care how long something takes if what we get in the end is great. By the way, you mentioned Game of Thrones. Did you see the news about Naomi Watts today? I did. And then they also dropped news about the male lead. Oh, I didn't hear. No, and I didn't hear I that. Forget his name, but he was in Poldark, and he was in something else. He's a very handsome man. <laughs> oh, <I'm, I'm, laughs> and, and he's, he's a television show guest. Yeah, let me tell you right now. I, I got excited about the Naomi Watts thing. I love side. her. She can do no wrong. You know, she is fifty years old now, and still to this day one of the dead sexiest women alive. Oh yeah, I, I, I mean, not to mention one of the greatest actresses in the business today. She's, she's amazing. Just, she's fantastic, and I, I've I've been a fan of hers. I mean. I think the greatest Japanese horror remake since, you know, the Halloween season is upon us is The Ring, right. which she stars in. And and she's just fantastic in that. 21 Grams, Academy 20, Award nomination for that. Mulholland, Mulholland Drive. Drive. Yeah, she's an amazing actress. And so great in Birdman with Michael Keaton. So good. And I think that that kind of casting is, is I, I just, what I really like overall is all of the genre material that we're getting, whether they're superhero movies or television, science fiction, horror, fantasy, we are living in a golden age. We're getting some of, great storytelling. And and the more people that stop, like 20 years ago, people thought, oh, I'm, I'm slumming if I'm in a superhero movie. Yeah. I'm slumming if I'm in a, a science fiction show or something. Now people are like, we're getting the best actors and the best creatives to do these things. And it's it's a golden age. So you shouldn't feel frustrated. I, I mean, if, there, if you're frustrated, there's no Batman movie. There's something coming. The Aquaman opens in a couple of months, and <laughs> yep. you're going to get Shazam, and we're going to get Wonder Joker Woman. and Wonder Woman. There's many things to wait for. We're living in in heck today. One of my favorite authors dropped one of my favorite book series, or yesterday, and uh, uh, Joe Ledger, who should be a, a weekly hero, but it's a horror novel series. And Stephen King dropped a new book yesterday. In two days, <laughs> in, in one day, I got two books. We live in fantastic times. And I still haven't even started watching Daredevil season three. Oh, There's so much good stuff out there. You're in for a treat. All right, let's get on to the next tweet. And the next tweet right now comes to us from Dan Veratu. I <laughs> love that name. Do you think Thanos will still play a big role in Avengers 4? Or will he take more of a backseat compared to his role in Infinity War? You know, that's a, a lot of speculation a lot of people have. What do you think Thanos' role is going to be? Is it going to be a big role like it was in, in 3? Or do you think it's going to be diminished in 4? No, I, I think it is going to be diminished in 4 because Thanos won. Yes. You know, he, he won. And I think what, what Avengers 4 is going to be concerned with is trying to take back that victory from Thanos in very creative ways. I mean, I think time travel is going to play a part. I think the quantum realm is going to play a part. And and I don't think Thanos is going to be as proactive in the movie. He's going to be in the background, I think. And I think there's going to be another antagonist that we don't know about yet. Ooh. I mean, I want to say Kang because he's a he's he's a time travel. He's, he's one of the most powerful villains in the MCU, like a Thanos. Uh, and they've kept a lot of stuff under wraps. But, I mean, I love... I love Thanos. I yeah, love Thanos' portrayal great. of Thanos. He's a great character, but I just think that they're not he's just not going to have the role that he had in in Infinity War. Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to agree with you and here's why. I think it's because they now they did everything they needed to do with Thanos to set this up. And I think he's going to be a significant character in Avengers 4, very significant, but you now need to turn this is an Avengers movie, you now need to turn more of the attention to the Avengers, yeah. to the individual characters and what they need to go through at this point. So while I do see him playing a big role and I, I just still see Avengers 4 
you know, the climax of it being XXX versus Thanos. Sure. I do believe that's the climax of the film and thus rounding off kind of this whole episode that we've had. But yeah, I think it will be diminished simply for that reason yeah. alone. All right. Last tweet of the day. Let's wrap this up here. The last question comes to us from Steve Johnston, who writes, John and Rob, will we ever get a Daredevil MCU movie on the big screen produced by Kevin Feige and co. What do you think, Rob? Are we ever going to see uh, Daredevil on the big screen? You know what? We might see him on the big screen as a supporting character, but I don't see an MCU Daredevil movie in our future only because they've mined so much of the classic Daredevil. They've done Elektra. You know, they're doing the, well, the Wilson Fist, sort of the Born Again storyline now. Yeah. There's been so much of, of Daredevil done and he's not he doesn't have that epic quality i don't know if he'll survive on the big screen but i could see him being in they should just bring him into the marvel cinematic universe as a as a supporting player but i don't think we're going to get a, a daredevil movie yeah you know there's two different ways to approach this there's the shoulds should they do it and will they shoulds up for debate i mean we we can debate the should of it should they do that there's there's a good argument to be had there Will they do it? Hell no. No, they're not. And they're not going to do it for several reasons. Number one, he's already had a several seri uh, uh, episodes or uh, seasons of his television series. There's that. The second thing is he's always been disassociated from the grander MCU because he's been in the Netflix show. On top of all that, if you want to get into some petty inner office politics, it's Perlmutter and Feige. And I don't know that Feige really wants anything to do with the Perlmutter stuff. So should they do it? You could make a case for that. Will they? I agree with you. I just don't see it happening. I don't think they're going to use them at all in the MCU, to be honest with you. No, you know, and if you think about it, if, if you include uh, Defenders, there's, what, 47 hours of TV now with, with Daredevil? Daredevil. <laughs> so you, you, I don't know what story you would tell. Yeah, and do you need to? And look, he's. This is one of the great things we've got. Great Daredevil, right? Like you said, forty plus hours of Daredevil. We can wrap yeah. our minds. Around. So I, I mean, so no, I don't think they will. And I'm actually okay with that. I'm Me actually too. okay. All right, guys, that will wrap it up for this week's installment of The Weekly Hero. Don't forget, Hot Off the Press is a brand new edition of The Weekly Hero. We'll hit your newsstand next week, of course. I want to thank my cohort over here, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, where can people find you online? Uh, people can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett, on Twitter at Burnett RM, on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. And finally, <laughs> my show, Rob's Observations, you can find the show about something is going to be up on the Burnett work on YouTube this week. And you know of course, I've said that for a month. <laughs> you've been saying for a while, but you know what? I'm just going to keep believing it every yeah. week. And of <laughs> course, stop. you guys can follow me on Twitter simply at John Campy. And listen, guys, if you want to see one of your topics brought up here on The Weekly Hero, just send out a tweet with the hashtag The Weekly Hero in there, and maybe you'll see your tweet pop up in the next issue of the show. That'll do it for me and Robert right now, guys. Thanks so much for being here. My name's John. That's Robert. You're who you are, and we'll see you next time.